Okay, we are recording. So I want to welcome everybody here to the North Carolina Maritime Museum in Beaufort's lecture series, the Maritime Heritage Lecture Series. This has been a virtual lecture series um, for COVID reasons for the last few months. Uh, today we have a great presentation by the museum's uh, conservator Michelle Cropo called It's Electrifying. Uh, Michelle has been putting together a great series of presentations about conservation and the work that goes on behind the scenes, largely behind the scenes. Actually, her lab is very visible, but um, largely behind the scenes so that we can get a better understanding of what happens to shipwreck artifacts and how what they can do to bring them out for study and display here at places like the museum. Uh, our Maritime Heritage Lecture Series is ongoing. It does take a little bit of a hiatus during the summer, but for this spring season, we have two more coming up. We have one coming up next week on the 13th called Golden Pirates of the Silver Screen. That one will also be virtual and it'll actually be presented by myself. Uh, and then we have another presentation coming up on the 28th called Fun on the Water. That one will be given by our maritime historian, David Bennett. And those will both be done live through Zoom and hopefully Facebook um, as well, as long as we can overpower those technical difficulties by then. Um, I appreciate everybody's patience I'm on getting this up and running. But once again, I want to welcome everybody. And I'm going, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, uh, plug them into the chat feature and I will get Michelle's attention at the appropriate time and let her know um, that you have a question or a comment or I'll relay the question or comment that you've put into the chat feature. So without further ado, I will hand over the floor to Ms. Cropo um, and her electrifying presentation. Go ahead, Michelle. All right. Heidi Ho, Conservarinos. It is I, Michelle Crapo, um, your conservator for the North Carolina Maritime Museum. And welcome to my presentation today titled It's Electrifying, um, in which we will be taking a hopefully leisurely stroll through the leisurely, the wonderful world of electrochemistry, where we discuss how electrolytic reduction is used to treat artifacts and archaeological conservation. Um, so we're going to begin with a brief overview just to kind of give you an idea of how this presentation is going to break down. Um, I'm going to give you a very brief kind of um, summary of what electrolytic reduction is. Then we're going to spend some time talking about electrochemical cells and how electrochemical cells are used to do work. And then we're going to talk about how conservators harness that work and make it do work for us. Basically how we use it to treat um, various archaeological materials and the various variables that we have to take in consideration when we're setting up those treatments, which affect our electrolytic reduction process. Um, so to begin, um, this there's gonna be a lot of vocabulary used in this presentation to try to ease us into it. We're gonna go over a few kind of um, basic terms that are gonna be cropping up a lot. Um, there will definitely be a lot of other vocabulary that shows up through the presentation, which I will try to explain in context. Um, first off, this presentation is going to be dealing a lot with different types of energy, um, particularly electrical energy and chemical energy. Um, electrical energy is basically electricity. It is energy that is produced by the movement of electrons. Um, chemical energy in um, comparison is any type of energy, be it electrical or thermal, that is produced or consumed in the process of a chemical reaction, such as um, the making of a compound or the breaking apart of a compound. And in particular, the chemical reaction that we're going to be focusing on today um, are oxidation reduction reactions, which are going to be abbreviated as redox reactions. So if you hear me mention redox reactions, what I'm referring to is an oxidation reduction reaction. And what this is, it's a chemical reaction in which the number of valence electrons, which are the electrons which inhabit this outer orbit of an atom, um, basically change in number. This is usually part of bond formation or bond, or bond breakage. Um, and it com is composed of two parts. It is composed of what is known as a reductant as well as an oxidant. So your reductant is the particle that is essentially losing an electron. It is in effect reducing another material, which is why it is called a reducing agent or a reductant. It is an active participant in this sort of bestowing of electrons. And what reduction means is that you are essentially 
reducing the net charge of the atom that is receiving that electron. Um, conversely, the oxidant is the, part the participant that is receiving the electron. It is, or more kind of actively, it is the atom that is essentially snatching that electron away from a different um, charged particle um, and keeping it more or less for itself. And this is kind of the basis of how um, oxidation reduction reactions occur. We'll go into them in a lot more detail in a little while. Um, another term that we're going to be using a lot is electrolyte. Um, for those of you who joined me for my previous presentation regarding desalination, um, electrolyte is a charged particle. It's an ion, it's a molecule, et cetera, that has electrical charge associated with it um, that is in solution and that is capable of conducting electrical energy through that solution. Um, and it usually conducts that energy in the context of electrochemistry and in the context of electrolyte reduction and other types of electrochemical cells. Um, it is transferring those electrical energy between what are two materials that we are gonna call electrodes. And electrodes are any solid material, um, usually metals, especially in the, the instance of this discussion, we're gonna be talking pretty much exclusively about solid metals um, that are able to conduct electric currents into a non-metallic substance. So into a liquid, a gas, a solid, et cetera. Um, and essentially, they essentially insert electrons into that material. And there are two types of electrodes. Um, there are cathodes and there are anodes. Um, the cathode is the electrode where the particles are reduced as a, in a redox reaction. So it is a site of reduction and it is also called the cathode because it attracts cations, which are positively charged, um, charged particles, so positively charged ions. Um, in sort of partnership with the cathode is the anode. Um, and this is the site or the electrode where particles are oxidized. So where um, they essentially lose electrons. Um, and this site is uh, also what attracts anions, so negatively charged ions in solution. Um, so that's going to be kind of the summation of some of the basic vocabulary. And as I said a little earlier, there will also be a lot more that comes up throughout the, this presentation, which I will explain as we go. Um, so to sort of surmise what electrolytic reduction is, you might also see it um, abbreviated as ER. Just know that when you see ER, that is referring to an electrolytic reduction process. Electrolytic reduction is in a type of electrolysis. And what electrolysis is, is literally using electrical energy to split a compound. It's right there in the name, electro meaning electricity or electron and lysis meaning to break apart. And electrolysis occurs inside of an electrochemical cell in which a chemical reaction is created and bonds are broken by the introduction of electricity, uh, which then drives an oxidation, re uh, ox a redox reaction. And this results in the transformation of the composition or identity of some form of matter. And in conservation, we use this to reduce, consolidate, clean, and desalinate archaeological materials. And I'll go into that in a lot greater detail further later on in this presentation. All right, so to begin with, what exactly is an electrochemical cell? So an electrochemical cell is essentially two different materials, again, usually metals, and for the purposes of this presentation, exclusively metals, um, which are in contact with each other. Um, they are in contact with each other, both physically, um, whether um, sometimes indirectly, sometimes directly, um, and they're also in contact with each other through being immersed in the same um, conductive medium, so the same electrolytic solution, for example. And what happens here is that this connection um, basically mediates the circulation of electrons from one material to another material while in solution. And this can happen um, in kind of a, a man-made way in a device like a battery that is basically an electrochemical cell in which you have electrons being passed, passed from one material to another. Um, these materials in the system known as electrochemical cell are going to be called both electrodes and also terminals based on the fact that they also have um, polar opposite electrical charges as well, um, which will depend on the type of cell which electrode has which electrical charge associated with it. Um, but basically the takeaway is that an electrochemical cell is a, basically an electrical circuit that forms between two different materials. And the materials are different, not just in terms of identity. So it's not just because this is zinc and this is copper, for instance. Um, they are different because they occupy different places on what is known as the electrochemical or sometimes called the electromotive series. And what this is, is you can see an example over here in the far right corner. Um, this series is kind of used 
very a lot we'll just say in chemistry it's used to describe a lot of different aspects of chemical reactions um, so you might hear people refer to the electrochemical series or something very similar to it often when talking about different parts of chemistry for example um, but for the purposes of this presentation we're just going to kind of simplify it and talk about it in the context of electrochemical cells. In the context of electrochemical cells, um, it's basically the tendency for a certain type of material to either give up or receive an election at an electron um, in comparison to um, what is kind of your base material, which in this case is hydrogen. So it's a comparative measure of how readily electrons are either, either given up or received in comparison to hydrogen, essentially. Um, when this is, a, when you apply a numerical value to this, when you give it um, sort of a quantitative or uh, quali quantitative value, uh, we say that this is called electric electrode potential in which the difference between um, the tendency to give up or receive electrons in comparison to hydrogen um, is given a number essentially in comparison to hydrogen. Hydrogen occupies a baseline of zero as a numerical value, in which case material that is more likely to give up electrons um, has a more positive numerical value than zero hydrogen. And material that is more likely to take electrons has a more positive value in relation to hydrogen. Um, so this is also sometimes known as electrode potential scale when it's assigned a numerical value. Um, it's also often talked about in context of thermodynamics and the concept of sort of stability and energy creation, um, in which case materials that are more electro have a more negative electro, um, electrode potential um, tend to be less stable, less noble materials, more reactive, and whereas material that is has a higher positive electrode potential than zero tends to be more energetically stable and more noble, more, more or less reactive material. Um, this will make sense a little, little bit later in the presentation. I'll explain that in a little bit more detail. Um, there's also, and as you might have kind of caught on to it, material that is more likely to give up an electron also makes it a stronger reductant. So some the more electro sort of negative it is on the scale in terms of electrode potential, the stronger or reductant that material is, and the more positive, the stronger an oxidizer that material is. So um, this will be put into context very shortly. Um, so that's sort of the basics of electrochemical cell. Um, and cells can happen, again, as I said, in sort of man-made devices like batteries. Um, they can also form just sort of naturally in nature. Um, in terms of material degradation, for example, on an archaeological site, if you have two different metals with two different um, electrochemical series positions, um, that are in physical contact, say, in the ocean, which itself is an electrolytic solution since it is full of salt ions, um, it will essentially under form an electrochemical cell with its environment, and one of those artifacts will um, preferentially corrode, essentially. Um, this also sometimes happens um, even within the same artifact. You can have slightly different um, poten electro potentials that form on the same artifact due to different exposures to um, Electro electrolytes and solution and moisture, for example, or even just things like composition of a material may not be uniform. So you have slight difference in composition. You have slight um, different inclusions, different metals, if it's an alloy, et cetera. All this can contribute to the formation of electrolytic chemical cell sort of in the real world and outside of these sort of very controlled scientific or um, intentional situations like that you would get in a battery. There are two types of electrochemical cells that we're going to be concerned with, uh, one of which is a galvanic cell, one of which is an electrolytic cell. So obviously, electrolytic cell is going to be what produces an electrolytic reduction reaction. Um, but in order to understand how an electrolytic cell works, we first have to understand a little bit more about how a galvanic cell works and sort of what the differences there and are. Um, the three major differences is basically, um, the first one is how energy is being used and how it is transformed. Um, galvanic cells are spontaneous, which means they happen naturally. It's entirely based upon those electromotive differences between the different materials, which um, produce a spontaneous uh, redox reaction, essentially. And this cell that forms transforms chemical energy, so energy that is produced by this reaction, into electrical energy that can be used to do work. Um, the other, I guess, major sort of difference is that the two electrodes have different 
charged um, terminal point. So they have a different charge than on an electrolytic cell. Your anode will be your negatively charged ter terminal in terms of the overall cell, whereas your cathode is the positively charged terminal in terms of the overall cell. Um, in comparison, electrolytic cells are instances where are non-spontaneous um, oxidation reduction reactions. Sorry, distraction. Okay, no, nothing's fun. Everything's good. <laughs> Um, which basically you need to consume outside energy to be able to occur. And they transform electrical energy into chemical energy. And what that means is they basically use electric energy um, to make chemical reactions happen. And they have differently, as I mentioned earlier, they have their terminal ends are slightly different, have basically the opposite polarity of what they are in a galvanic cell. With your anode being the positively charged terminal and your cathode being the negatively charged terminal. And I'll talk a little bit more about how those polarities form um, in the next few slides. Um, so those are your basic differences between a galvanic and electrolytic cells. And these are the two cells that we um, encounter most when thinking about chemistry and conservation, mostly because galvanic cells are often related to galvanic corrosion, which are those cells that form in nature and cause the corrosion of artifacts, whereas electrolytic cells tend to be what we use to try to reverse some of that damage caused by the corrosion. All right, so next we're going to talk a little bit about how electrochemical um, work, and we're going to talk a little bit more in detail about oxidation reduction reactions as promised. So going back to the idea of a spontaneous redox reaction. So a spontaneous redox reaction requires no outside energy to activate itself. It is basically self-activating. It will spontaneously occur based entirely on the differences between the two materials that are in contact with each other. So this is entirely driven by the differences in their electrode potentials. Um, electrode potentials are measured in volts. Um, and basically, and also, so you can see right here in this example, you have the reductant, which loses an electron. Um, and and to your oxidant, which then gains an electron, and there is a net change in their oxidation states, meaning essentially how many electrons they have and thus their charge. And sometimes they produce neutral material, sometimes they charge, um, produce charged particles. Um, but overall, what they produce must be more energetically um, reduced in terms of the overall system than what they currently were. Um, so basically this means that the products that are, why the spontaneous redox reactions occurs is because nature, the universe, um, it tends towards lower energy states and will drive reactions in that direction. So it, basically products that are more energetically favorable, that are more stable, um, that are more electro, in terms of electro potential, more positive as a result or more favorable. Um, this is sometimes discussed in terms of Gibbs free energy, which is what you see here, this Delta G symbol. Um, Gibbs free energy is basically the totality of all the energy reactions that happen in a reaction. So it is um, basically the measure of how much energy is released or consumed in the form of heat. And it's also a measure of how energy is distributed in, in, a, in a system. If it's spread, the more spread out it is, the more and more stable it is, the more energetically um, favorable it is. And so when we say that um, basically the energy cannot increase in a system. So for a spontaneous redox reaction to happen, happen, um, your energy level must be less than whatever that delta G form is for that system. So basically, when we say that it has a Gibbs free energy constant that is less than zero, um, that is a signifier that en more energy has been reduced in the system, or at least not increased, and is therefore a spontaneous reaction has occurred. Um, so how this looks in an actual cell is that electrochemical cells that use spontaneous redox reactions are kind of a nesting matryoshka doll of redox reactions um, that sort of build into each other. Um, and this happens, um, oh, so sorry, I'm gonna go back. And this has something to do with something called the overall cell potential. So basically it's an accumulative um, phenomenon where you have two reactions that are actually happening, two half reactions is what we call them. Um, you have the oxidation half, oh, right, I should rethink that for a second. All right, so in your cell, there, there's an overall cell, that there's an overall reaction that happens in the cell, which consists of your two anode and cathode materials. So there's a redox reaction that happens between these two materials. Whether or not that redox reaction occurs and in what direction it occurs, meaning which one gets to be the cathode and which one gets to be the anode, 
is dictated by redox reactions that happen between um, your actual your electrode material and its immediate environment. So there's actually a redox reaction that happens um, between the anode in its environment, for example, and the cathode in its environment, for example. And this kind of difference between those two reactions is what dictates how the chemical reaction of the electrochemical cell will proceed. Um, these are called half reactions. And what this sort of looks like in context is you have your anode material. So you have your material, which is not only more electro, um, sort of has a more, has a <clears throat> more negative electromotive position on the electrochemical series than your copper cathode, for example, but it also has a relationship. Um, but the reason that happens is based on its relationship um, to the environment that's surrounding it. Um, so this half reaction that occurs at the anode is also called the oxidation cell. This is the site where oxidation of the anode material occurs. Um, so what happens is that you have your anode material that's usually put into an aqueous solution that has an electrolyte in it. And in solution, you have things like water molecules, and you also have anions and cations that have disassociated into solution and are available to do work. So what basically happens is that they essentially start reacting with that anode material. They go through their own oxidation reduction re reactions, in which case you have um, basically the dissolution of the anode material that is essentially corroding in this, uh, this electrolytic solution. Um, and what's happening is that you have a production of cations of that metal that are then being released into the surrounding environment um, while their electrons sort of hang around on the surface. And this kind of thin layer around um, the anode or, or, or cathode material, which are called the analyte and catholyte, respectfully, um, are kind of the, the real key area that dictates what that redox half reaction looks like in this part of the cell. And also is what dictates their overall um, charge potentials essentially as terminals um, for this big electrochemical battery. Um, so what happens is you get this sort of um, buildup of cations that happens outside of the anode material. So that area becomes effectively more relatively positive than the anode material, um, which is building up electrons that are being released by these redox reactions between the anode and the surrounding environment. Um, and that's basically what causes um, the anode material to be um, negatively charged is that relatively that relative pause difference um, charge difference between the anode material, um, which is kind of collecting electrons on the surface and the immediate environs, which are collecting a lot of cations, essentially a lot of positively charged materials, which are giving that immediate area around it um, and, a, and a relative electrical charge. In contrast, at the cathode, you sort of have a similar but sort of opposite process happening. Um, you also have um, a certain amount of dissolved cations and anions and also water molecules, which are all disassociating in solution and reacting with that cathode metal that is producing also um, cathode anions. However, what you are also giving, however, those cathode anions, I'm sorry, cat, who are producing a lot of metal cations, which are then collecting at the surface of this material. Um, whereas electrons are actually being transferred from the surface of your cathode material um, to this area of relative positive charge where you have all these sort of waiting cations that are just waiting to take on an electron of their own. So you end up getting this relative charge differential that occurs between the cathode material, which is relatively positive, um, compared to the immediate environs where all those electrons are, are basically collecting and where that reduction reaction is happening. Um, and this reduction process that is happening up here basically results in um, electrons reducing all these metal cations um, to solid metal or to some sort of solid um, um, precipitate um, that then forms on the cathode. So sometimes this, in an ideal situation, this will be solid metal. If you only have like copper ions, for example, you'll be getting solid copper um, basically accumulating on the surface. Um, and in a mixed setting, you might get some copper and some other materials also forming. So um, there's also a bit of a, a refining process that has to go on if you're what you're really going for is to extract pure metal. Um, but anyway, these half cell potentials, as you can say, produce their own potential. Um, so this half cell potential is the potential that is produced between um, the cathode material in this case, or the anode uh, material and the outside environment. And this is what sort of determines that electrode, that initial electrode potential. Um, so as you can see, the cathode half cell potential is a positive integer. Um, whereas the 
anode material is a negative integer um, in comparison to the, the electrolytic solution, the environment that it's currently sitting in. Um, so taking those values, we can then determine the overall um, value of the cell. We can basically determine the cell potential of the cell and thereby determine a, if a reaction will happen, and if so, which react, what direction it's going to get into, who gets to be the overall anode, who gets to be the overall cathode um, for the cell. And so when you have a cell, and so basically, so this is where that physical connection really comes into play. In this case, you can see it's a, a wire that connects them. Um, but what happens is you get a current that forms. So as essentially electrons are leaving the surface of your cathode material um, to reduce all those metal cations that are floating around. It's exerting a, a basically um, a, an electron vacuum force almost. It is essentially pulling or drawing electrons towards it. Um, and those electrons that it is drawing are being provided by your anode material, which is more likely to give up electrodes, electrons to it um, just based on that electromotivity series. Um, so you have a situation where you have a current that is formed that is flowing um, from the cathode to the anode, meaning that there's a force being exerted by the cathode that is essentially conduct, um, pulling on those electrons from the anode, conducting them through that physical connection, and then providing them to the cathode, which in turn continues to provide um, to the immediate environs around it and reduce the materials that are present. Um, whereas the anode is continuously oxidized by what's around it and is losing electrons at the same time. Um, so you can sort of see in a um, unbuffered situation, sort of an uncontrolled situation, you end up having kind of destruction of your anode material where it is essentially being dissolved away as electrons are being taken from it um, and it's being reduced to metal cations. Um, those electrons are going up the circuit and then depositing on your cathode, as you can see here, as solid copper material. Um, so you can kind of think about this as, in the end, it's all a relay race. Um, and in this example, I should backtrack a little bit. Um, you also, sometimes you're, uh, they're in the, your two cathodes or your two electrodes are in the same solution. Um, sometimes they're, if you need to separate them for whatever reason, they are connected by an, a salt bridge. Um, basically, this is where your electrolytes come in. Because um, not only is there a current being exerted from the cathode um, to the anode, there's also a current being um, exerted from the anode um, to the cathode, which is essentially pulling um, cations, which is essentially pulling anions, so, an so basically charged particles that have extra electrons on them um, towards itself. And this basically creates um, a circuit, or as I like to think about sort of a relay race of electrons, um, where instead of baton, they are passing around electrons between them. Um, so again, you have electrons which are traveling um, from your anode material, they're being sent to your cathode, which is then using them to discharge material, which is then building up on the surface. Um, in the meantime, you have this buildup of anions and cations respectfully kind of happening at other end, and they're also being pulled in opposite directions um, due to the basically the buildup of cations that is occurring at outside of your anode that is attracting anions to them. The anions themselves are carrying electrons since they are um, negatively charged um, and thus have extra electrons and thus kind of continue a, a sustained continual redox reaction that occurs. Um, and basically to determine the overall cell potential, um, we look at in which electrode gets to be which one. Um, we take the material that we would like to be our cathode and subtract the half cell potential of the anode from it to get our overall cell potential. And you can see here, you have a positive number, which is then subtracting a negative number, which gets you a net positive value for your electrochemical cell. So basically this means that Overall, you have a spontaneous reaction at play, um, and the, this will basically go unprompted. You don't need any type of outside control or mitigation to make this to make this redox reaction occur in the direction that you want to get the product that you want, which is basically solid reduced copper. Um, so, in comparison, what we are really looking into, though, are non-spontaneous redox reactions, which, are, of course, are the opposite of spontaneous redox reactions. Um, spontaneous redox reactions are usually monodirectional, meaning they only go in one direction um, because of those differences in, in cell potentials. Um, obviously, if you have an anode material, which is more negative than its um, cathode in, in terms of cell potential, um, then to try to flip that and make the anode somehow more positive doesn't happen on itself. You need to do something um, to 
basically make that happen. And the only way that we do that is adding an outside elect of energy source, which I'll talk a little bit more in, uh, in, in a few minutes, um, which basically compensates for more electromotively positive reductant um, and at, basically overcomes that activation energy ba um, barrier um, and increases that cell potential um, so that it is less than zero and basically makes it so that um, more energy is not actually created by this reaction and the Gibbs free energy constant remains below zero. All right, so how does it actually work in a cell? Um, so I, as I was kind of jumped the gun a little bit, but in, as you can, as we were talking about, obviously how you need spontaneous reactions go one direction. They need to have an overall positive um, cell potential that occurs just sort of methodically. Um, so you end up getting, um, just based on the electromotive series, you end up getting one material, which is more anodic versus more, more cathodic. One's more of a reductant, one's a better oxidizer, and they are not going to change those um, jobs basically just because you want them to. You have to do something to basically change that reaction. Um, otherwise, you end up getting a negative overall cell, um, cell potential value, which of course means it's not going to happen. Um, not going to happen. So what you do is that you add energy, you add basically more energy um, than is equivalent to the overall cell potential that you would get in sort of the normal spontaneous reaction. So you add an outside energy source. Basically, you plug it into a DC power source um, and let do that do the work for you. This basically flips um, your anode and cathode values. So it kind of changes what would have been a negative value into a positive value and vice versa, so that you do get that overall positive cell potential value. And so you do create a reaction that is viable. You create a reaction that is going essentially in the right direction um, in which that gives free energy constant um, remains less than zero. All right, so how does this look like in practice? Um, so basically this is driven not because you have an intrinsic oxidation reaction that is happening necessarily between um, your anode between your cathode your desired cathode material and the solution but because you are basically exerting um, sort of almost an artificial one on its surface um, so what you do is that you have um, basically a battery a dc battery or dc power source which also contains its own obsolete charged terminal so basically um, it can change its own anode essentially and you hook this up um, and physically attach it to um, your material that you would like to act as a cathode. And what this does is that it sends um, electrons into the material itself. Um, and since that you're sending an excess of mater uh, material into that material, um, you basically get sort of, you do end up with the absent reaction um, where you have electrons being fed into, the, into your anode material. Um, and then those electrons are then interacting with cations in solution. Um, to produce your solid precipitant, um, that reduced metal that we're after. Um, this also means, however, that um, basically there is a, a, a charge that is the electrode potential that occurs between in this half cell reaction that occurs between the anode in the mediate environs is established not because of this intrinsic redox reaction that would like to happen, but because you have an outdoor uh, outside power source that is sort of forcing it, um, that is sort of making this anode, anode more negative um, making this material more negative um, than its outside constituents. Um, thus freezing. Sorry, question, sorry. Yeah, so, um, sorry, just a, a forgot, yes. Um, so you have, elect so basically it's called electrolysis because you are having um, electrons basically being jettisoned into your cathode material. Um, that is then essentially splitting bonds. It is creating um, basically anions and cations that can do, do work, including an excess of electrons um, that then essentially can then act to reduce your cation material, which is building up on the, ex on the exterior of the cathode. Um, and you might notice that these um, terminal polarities of these terminals have flipped in comparison to your galvanic cell. And that is because of the cathode um, in this half reaction, it is acting as sort of the negative terminal, the terminal of the um, material that is receiving your electrons in comparison to the um, anode material, the material that is um, providing your electrons um, that is occurring inside of your battery or your electrical power source. Um, and we use direct current or DC energy and not AC energy because DC current has a, um, a fixed terminal. So this 
terminal will always be positively charged, for example, um, will always be positively charged, whereas in um, alternative, al alternating current or AC power, you have your terminal polarities flipping constantly. And obviously that's not gonna do us much good, especially when this um, external battery is the reason why you are having an electrode potential that is occurring um, between these two materials in the first place. Um, so, what, so of course we would want our DC power source, which provides a constant um, polarity so that we can predict and dictate the reaction and the products that form therein. Um, and basically the overall reaction product that occurs um, is that you essentially have a, a positive electrode potential that forms between your cathode material and your negative material in your in immediate environs. Um, and of course the opposite is happening at your anode material, which in normal circumstances would be your cathode material. Um, but in this case, it is functioning as um, the anode end of an exterior battery essentially, and is thus having electrons taken from it and put back into this power source. Um, so it is essentially, um, it is having electrons taken from it and is producing, cat it is <coughs> producing a lot of metal and producing an environment of metal cations as a, as a result and is basically slowly dissolving. Um, but I guess I should say that the, Sorry, we're good. Um, so it, this produces a relatively negative potential that exists between um, the anode and its immediate environs. So to kind of go back to our overall sort of cell network, you now have a situation in which you have electrons traveling. Um, so basically, if you look comparison from the redox, um, the spontaneous redox version of this reaction, you have electrons um, oops, that is wrong. All right, so basically, um, and as we saw before, this overall char charge potential, then the difference becomes negative, um, becomes a positive value, and you get a, a redox reaction that happens in the direction that you would like it to um, with your anode. Uh, sorry, no, I was right. All right, so to compare the two different cells um, in a spontaneous reaction, you have electrons being um, spontaneously transferred from your anode material um, to your material that is kind of naturally an anode to one that is naturally a cathode um, in a spontaneous circuit lynch based on the, and then having electrons return to it in this. And I, thoughts, all right. <laughs> basically you are having an opposite reaction occur in either cell. So basically you, you have flipped this reaction. So if the electrons are essentially going in the opposite direction more or less just based on the material they are actually still progressing in a way in which you get the same types of results though um, even though you have flipped the polarity of the anode and the cathode and you have flipped which one is acting as which one you are essentially still getting the same processes happening at either electrode you are still getting um, a reduction reaction happening at your cathode and you're still getting an oxidation reaction that is happening at your anode um, so you essentially still kind of get the outcomes that you want in which your cathode material is still producing that extra um, reduced material, um, that pot, that physical precipitate that is forming on it, and your anode is sacrificially being oxidized and corroding and dissolving um, by the system, essentially. All right, so that is more or less kind of the basics of how electrolytic cells work is basically they are reversing what is happening in a spontaneous reaction by the application of energy and sort of um, forcibly switching which one is the anode and the cathode by basically putting it into a cell reduction and to a half reduction that occurs between the anode or the cathode and its battery and the terminal that exists therein. But otherwise, it's pretty much the same set setup. You still have a physical connection that is needed, and you still need to have some sort of electrolytic solution um, that can still carry those electrons between the two electrodes um, and sort of make sure that that material is, is circulating, circulating, that there's no buildup of charge at one end that can throw off or stop your, 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 re your reaction. Um, so basically, this is obviously kind of an, a useful technique, the ability to basically undo the work of corrosion by undoing spontaneous um, redox reactions that form in the corrosion of one metal. We can then pretty much harness this power um, to try to 
then reduce or reform those materials that were lost. Um, so what do we use electrolytic reduction to do in conservation? Um, well, we use it to chemically and physically stabilize archaeological metals. Um, this is particularly true of ferrous metals, particularly cast iron. Um, and that is because cast iron um, tends to be a little bit more robust um, than wrought iron, for example. Wrought iron is pretty much pure iron ferrite with some other inclusions when it's produced and it tends to corrode in a way that's a lot more rapid. Um, cast iron has a lot of carbon that's been added to it, which changes its properties, makes it a little bit more corrosion resistant as a, as a process. Um, so as a result, it tends to survive a little bit better in your typical marine burial environment, for example. Um, and we use, we use um, electrolytic reduction to do a variety of things because we don't just use it um, for this reduction reaction. Um, this reduction reaction also has a lot of additional benefits, which I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail at this time. Um, so we use it, um, first of all, we use it to sometimes remove material that is on top of our artifact. So basically we try to clean it. Um, we can use it to remove concretion and accreted material as well as sometimes superficial um, corrosion layers and parts of the barrel matrix that are still attached to it. Um, so sometimes you might see um, a material that is excavated from a burial site um, and put directly into an electrolytic reduction situation, um, in which case they will partially be used to try to remove um, any material that is on the surface that we don't really want. We we're trying to recover that original or as much of the original surface of the artifact as we can. Um, we also use it to chemically and physically stabilize important surface of the artifact. Um, that's when that reduction process really comes into play. That's when we're really kind of looking at the deposition of some type of of uh, material that basically has basically corrosion reversed. We're trying to transform corrosion products into either um, solid metal again, or more, more commonly a, a different type of corrosion, a mineral product or corrosion product that is more um, chemically and physically stable, um, energetically speaking. Um, we also use it primarily though, um, to aid in desalination of an artifact that has been put into a salt rich environment. Um, the salts can be very destructive, particularly when we talk about, as we've discussed in detail, um, salts are a good electrolyte, so they can um, are huge participants in galvanic corrosion and that formation of that galvanic cell that can happen um, on artifacts and cause corrosion in the first place. Um, so we also want to try to remove that material as much of those electrolytes that are inside the artifact or um, as possible. Um, so we can try to make it more uh, chemically stable so it doesn't react quite as much. All right. Um, yes. So our first example is the, basically the electrolytic reduction of water. Essentially, um, is one of the example is one of the um, sort of bonus chemical reactions or sort of additional chemical reactions that occurs during electrolytic reaction. Um, in which case you have because um, you're not you don't just have the anode material that is being oxidized. You don't just have the cathode material that is being um, reduced. You also have a lot of other things in your solution, including water molecules, including other types of electrolytes. And these are also kind of being reduced and oxidized um, as well at the same time in the same areas. Um, so what we have at the anode, you're also, for instance, creating oxygen gas um, by reducing um, hydroxy anions that are being attracted to the anode. Um, and conversely, at the cathode, you have hydrogen gas being um, produced by the reduction of hydrogen, atom, uh, hyd hydrogen ions, which are gathering around um, the surface of the cathode. Um, and we, as an example of what we do with this is, um, generally, these two gases aren't necessarily being produced at the same rate. Uh, at the same rate. Obviously, your, your major source of these are essentially water molecules that have been lysed or broken apart and are dissociated into solution. And since for every one oxygen molecule, you have two hydrogen molecules in water, um, you tend to get almost twice the amount of hydrogen gas as you do oxygen gas. So hydrogen gas is kind of the one that we're really looking at. Um, but what happens is that as you're producing this oxygen gas, um, and this gas is expanding underneath these layers of corrosion and concretion, et cetera, um, that expansion, the volumetric expansion happens through the evolution of this gas um, can actually kind of basically pop those materials off for you. Um, so it basically can mechanically remove um, materials that are on the surface of your artifact. So that is one use um, for electrolytic reduction and how we kind of harness certain byproducts of that initial reduction reaction um, to obtain these other ends. Um, another and so then there's the actual reduction and consolidation um, that occurs. Because um, you are, because um, electrolysis, um, you're, you're splitting electrochemical bonds between corrosion products, but you're also um, creating cations 
at your cathode material. Um, so your cathode material is slowly being covered in this new material um, that is being formed. Um, this includes solid metals um, as well as corrosion products. And in, in the case of iron materials, it's usually magnetite, um, which is a very stable mineral product. And what happens, um, so you have, electric, yes. So you have like these, um, so for this example, we have our cast iron cation, um, you're adding electricity to it. Um, you're having this evolution of, of hydrogen gas. You have attracting, attracting these hydroxy ions, but you're also um, creating these metal cations, these iron cations, which are available then sort of at the surface of your cathode to have things happen to them. And as you add electrons into this process, um, you're essentially causing these two iron molecules, et cetera, to form a bond with each other. Um, this is part of reducing, and then they deposit on the surface as a solid material. Uh, at the same time, um, you are also eventually you kind of get a layer of maybe iron ferrite, sort of that returned solid metal, um, but more likely you're getting a bunch of magnetite that is forming. And as you can see, the surface of cast iron or any type of metal is not necessarily perfect. Um, you're going to have um, different species of corrosion products. You're also going to have gaps. You're going to have uh, material which may not be really well attached, et cetera. Um, so the consolidation part of reduction is that you are essentially depositing the solid material which can fill in those gaps um, and basically give yourself a more solid, um, stable surface to work with. So you don't have to worry about um, basically spalling or the loss of material. Um, you can sort of see the difference in this um, micrograph over here between um, before electrolysis and after electrolysis of this lead material. You can sort of see how the material has been smoothed out and there's a lot more deposition and a lot more kind of gaps have been felt have been filled in and things have been more tightly secured to the surface due to the deposition of this reduction product both um, you know perhaps reduced solid metal that has been basically trans um, reversed from its corrosion product or the deposition of a corrosion product like magnetite which is a more stable uh, material than um, some of the other products that you have here like hematite mag paint like um hematite and mag hematites and um, girthite as well. Um, but the main reason that we use electrolytic reduction um, is for desalination. So we're going to talk about some desalination again. Um, so basically salt ions, including particularly chloride ions, um, will diffuse when, once you have your artifact in solution, for example, um, these ions will naturally diffuse out to solution, um, into solution through a concentration gradient. Um, this concentration gradient is mostly dictated um, by how much chloride you have inside your artifact versus the amount of chloride you have in the immediate area outside of your artifact, um, in which case um, that chloride will immediately go from area of higher concentration to lower concentration. Um, how, um, and this, and the obviously the bigger the difference between um, the environment the artifact is in, the fewer chlorides that are in that environment, and the more chloride you have inside your artifact, um, the the faster that initial rate of diffusion is going to happen. Um, and obviously, the shallow if you have a more shallow difference, the shallower that gradient, and the slower that rate of diffusion. Um, and of course, if you just allow something to sit in water over time and diffuse out, your um, diffusion doesn't does not go in one direction, unlike redox reactions. Um, so you're also going to have, a, uh, eventually you're going to have an area where there's equal sides, uh, equal amounts of chloride ions, both inside your artifact and in that solution. Um, and they're just going to be kind of moving back and forth until there's equal amounts in both spaces. And obviously um, this kind of shuts down your diffusion gradient and isn't very useful for desalination if this is kind of allowed. Um, also, um, there's also an electric gradient that does exist that also helps drive some of those desalination processes. Um, and that what basically, unfortunately, um, in, even though we, we, we can and often do use water that has been purified, um, we can't necessarily stop all it from being full of other things. Um, yeah, so there is an electric gradient that occurs um, between the inside and the outside. I just let me backtrack for a second. Um, just by virtue of sort of the, the charge that tend to be on chloride ions tends to be negative versus the relatively positive space on the outside where there are no chlor um, chlorides. And in sort of a, a ideal situations where you have a pure solution, there's nothing in it but water, um, this charge will obviously sort of drive um, your chlorides out of the solution towards um, the more positive um, polarity that is occurring in the space outside of the cell. Um, however, um, 
we even in filtered water, we often don't have um, a pure solution and we often have other materials in it, other cations, other, um, other cations, other anions, other types of um, microbes and things that are taking up space that are having their own sort of competing um, both electrical and um, concentrating concentration gradients that are occurring. Um, and often, you know, we try to often put these um, materials, especially when they're really large items like a cannon, often you can't really spare that much purified water. So you often just kind of use tap water, um, which is full of types of things. Um, we also tend to desalinate archeological materials as I've discussed before um, in other presentations, particularly metals in a, a solution that is buffered, meaning it contains purposely cations and anions that are there to try to scoop up um, sort of miscellaneous um, hydro um, hydrogen hydroxy uh, materials to try to stabilize your pH and make it more alkaline. However, this also introduces more electrolytes into solution and more things with charge. So you end up getting this very kind of convoluted kind of confused gradient as a result um, where, you know, everything is kind of precipitating along its own charge gradient, its own concentration gradient, and this can very much slow down um, that charge gradient um, by a lot since basically you're going to have an equilibrium um, since when you have a balanced net charge both inside your artifact as well as outside by sort of the diffusion of these differently charged materials, um, you are going to come to a point of equilibrium where they're balanced and where that diffusion process basically shuts down. Um, however, um, when you have an electrolytic cell and you basically have the benefit of, a of establishing a fixed permanent polarity that occurs in your solution. Um, so you have your anode material, which is uh, pos relatively positively charged, and your cathode material, which is relatively negatively charged. Um, and this means that you could have a much stronger electrical gradient that is um, driving this, some of these diffusion activities in which all your anions are being pulled to your, your anode material um, and all your cations are being pulled towards your cathode material. And the subtraction of these anodes, anodes do, um, anions does include your chloride anions. Um, so this can basically make desalination a lot more effective. You can remove a lot more chlorides a lot faster and a lot more effectively. Um, it really speeds up this rate that occurs um, and can reduce treatment time um, from, you know, treatment time for standard desalination with that kind of stop and go where you keep reaching equilibrium, you keep having to change out your solution, you keep having to make adjustments versus something that has an established permanent uh, polarity to it. Um, you can reduce something that might take a decade or more in treatment to something that can basically be half that time that might take up five or six years instead of um, 10 or 12. So that's an extremely useful tool of electrolytic reduction and is the main um, one of the main reasons we use this technique. Um, of course, when we're setting up our electrolytic reduction um, um, setup, we, there's a lot of variables we do have to take into account, uh, account to make sure that basically we are getting the outcomes that we want. Um, the system is operating in the way that we decide, desire. Um, a lot of this has to do with sort of the placement of your, um, your anode, your anode in relation to the cathode, as well as your cathode's sort of um, relation, physical spatial relationship to the power source, AI, i.e. like um, in terms of the electron load that is receiving. Um, we also have to pay a lot of attention to current density, um, as well as electrolyte concentration and pH of the solution. These are all things that um, contribute both to um, the effectiveness of our system, but also their long-term um, sustainability to make sure that we can use these materials for as long as possible and they work the, the way we want um, for as long as possible. All right, so your electrolytic reduction setups, um, sort of a classic example over here. Um, generally speaking, you have your artifact, um, it's in a tank. Um, that tank needs, is usually made of some sort of non-conductive material that is also acid or caustic resistance. Um, these can be made of glass, rarely, um, might also be made of PVC or polyethylene or polypropylene, so some sort of polymer or plastic material. Um, often, if you're kind of doing it yourself or you have very large artifacts or artifacts that are very oddly shaped, for example, um, it might be a lot easier to produce a wooden frame, which you can then line with like a PVC liner, et cetera, to give it a little bit of extra insulation. Um, there also are setups which do use conductive containers as well, um, in which case the container itself 
is your anode. Um, but those can be kind of complicated because obviously you have to control your experimental conditions very precisely to make sure that um, your anode material survives for as long as possible and you don't accidentally put a hole in your tank essentially and then everything's out on the floor um, and as well as your electrolytic cell being disrupted. For your anode material, um, you know, since we're dealing mostly with cast iron or wrought iron, our anode material um, is something that is comparable but um, something that we can make easily uh, more anodic to our cathode material or the material that we would like to perform to act as the cathode. Um, we usually use mild steel. Um, this is the site where you have ev um, the evolution of O2 happening. Um, sorry. So usually you have your um, cathode set, set up in your anode set up. So you have um, some sort of conductive material that might be attaching it. Um, usually it's um, these gator clips. Um, sometimes it's another piece of metal that is kind of transmitting for you um, that is physically connecting um, your cathode to your power supply, et cetera, um, through which the electrons travel. Um, your anode setup, um, we often use, sometimes you might use metal mesh sheeting. Sometimes you might just use um, plates, like metal plates, essentially like sheet metal. Um, this case, we also kind of have the added benefit of, of wanting to put Usually, um, and these anode materials might be um, attached to the sides of your container, um, sort of running parallel to your artifact and covering the surface area. Um, a lot of times, though, we do put an additional anode or the anode in general on the bottom, um, sort of as a bottom plate or a bottom um, sort of net mesh. And this basically um, means because this anode material, as we discussed a little earlier, is producing oxygen gas. It's basically um, acting as its own bubbler, so to speak. Um, so that bubbling action produced by the oxygen evolution helps circulate your electrolyte, which we'll get into a little bit later as to why that's impor um, important, but basically it prevents um, the buildup of both charge at your uh, buildup of anions or cations at your site that could um, basically cause a charge imbalance. Um, and specifically, it also um, prevents the buildup of chloride ions as well. Um, so that's sort of your basic setup. Um, there are a lot of different variations on the setup which have their own sort of um, their own um, kind of pros and cons to them. Um, obviously, there's also a difference between treating a single artifact and treating a batch, a, a batch a treatment or many artifacts at the same time. You know, if you um, a cannon is one thing; it's a very large artifact. It, it's kind of um, deserving, if you are, of its own electrolytic setup. When you have a lot of kind of smaller artifacts like cannonballs or nails, etc., uh, it might be more beneficial to do something we call a batch treatment, which basically try to treat things together um, in the same space using the same resources, essentially. Um, so you have an example. This is an example of um, a single artifact being placed into electrolytic solution that has a single anode, a, si a single terminal, cathode terminal, um, and its anode is actually, um, in this case, sort of encasing. Your artifact, um, this allows you more control, essentially. So this um, basically gives you a lot more um, kind of precision in what you're removing, what you're doing by creating an anode that is kind of custom fitted to your artifact. However, that's not always practical. Um, so often um, we have anodes that are um, kind of only partially associated with the artifact or associated sort of only on one side or else um, um, they, they, we kind of, we divide up the surface area, I guess, that they're um, in contact with. Um, we have batch treat, we have various batch treatment setups, like what you see over here, where you have um, kind of the really, really sort of ideal for a batch treatment, where you have um, your artifact that has its own anode, its own um, cathode, and has its own separate power source. Um, so it is not sharing anything. So these are kind of one-to-one -one reactions that are happening in every single cell. So there's three electrolytic cells that are basically happening here. Um, however, this takes a lot of energy, uh, a lot of resources that often you don't have. It may just not be practical to do this. Um, so often what you have are A, B, and sometimes C, or sometimes or C, D, and sometimes E setups over here, um, where you have um, basically some sort of shared resources. Um, for instance, um, this example has a shared anode. Um, each cathode has its own connection, though, um, to a shared power source. Um, in this example, um, you have a shared power source um, and cathode. Um, basically, you have a shared power source as well as a, a shared, um, basically, cathode connection point. So either, even though these are all acting as their individual cathodes and sort of their own 
um, reaction processes that are happened. And when it comes to essentially the electron load that they are receiving from your power source, it is being diffused across um, the sort of connecting rod that is connecting them. Um, so obviously artifacts that are closer to this power source are essentially um, receiving a larger load of electrons than the ones that are further away. Um, so you have to kind of manage these setups rather carefully. Um, you often have to rotate these artifacts if you want to make sure they get kind of an even distribution of electrons and kind of receive that current load evenly um, so they can all receive kind of the same level of, um, of desalination, reduction, et cetera, cleaning. Um, and in sort of a, this bottom situation is a little unusual, but sometimes this is an example where you have your anode basically being um, the container itself, including these sort of side vats. And the important thing in this setup is that your anode material has to be equal distance from your cathode so that you don't have um, this sort of competing charge. Like everything has to be very precisely placed. Um, obviously, this is kind of limited by how much space you have. So these are all sort of different factors that go into determining um, how your electrolytic setup is going to look, um, what your anodes, your anode placement is going to be. Um, you know, are you going to have a single anode that is shared amongst your artifacts? Are you going to have individual artifacts for each artifact, um, individual anodes for each artifact, et cetera? Um, are you going to have a shared power supply? Are you going to have individual power, power supply? Um, obviously, they have different sort of effects in terms of efficacy. Obviously, the more powers, you know, everything with its own sort of contained individualized electrolytic cell is going to be more effective than if you try to create um, electrolytic cell amongst various cathodic materials, especially when they're sharing uh, resources. Um, and sort of piggybacking off of this is the concept of current density. Um, current density is the measure of basically an amount of electrical charge passes through a discrete area in a given amount of time, and it is represented by amperes um, divided by centimeters square. So this is a relationship um, between the amount of energy that you're sending through a particular point in space over a given amount of time. Um, and this is an area that mathematically can be determined by looking at the ratio of the artifact surface. So the surface that you're trying to reduce and use as your cathode um, versus the surface area that is available for your anode. So the amount of material that you're using um, to oxidize and to drive um, this reduction reaction on the other end of your circuit. Um, but but at this react, um, it really only kind of, but um, sort of this, the mathematical precision of which you calculate this um, really only comes into play if you have um, one of those anode materials that is kind of custom fit to surround your artifact. And you have to kind of really, really deeply calculate how much surface area is on your artifact versus how much surface area of your anode. Uh, most cases, you kind of have um, partial coverage. Like your anode is only in contact with half your artifact if it's on the bottom or like piece or you know several places on the side. Um, so that usually kind of um, is a little simpler process. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more in, in, in the future, but a lot of times we just kind of eyeball it based on the hydrogen evolution, um, determine what the, what the current density is. Um, but your current de density is reflected by um, a, a plethora of other variables, which in turn um, sort of feed into each other. Um, electrical resistance basically is the um, ease with which an electrical current can pass through an artifact. It's basically, it's a measure of how good a conductor it is. Um, your electrolyte con concentration is obviously the amount of electrolyte you have in your solution, but also in the immediate environs around your anode and your cathode. Um, um, current density is also um, affected by fluctuations in your electrode potential, um, as, as well as sort of the quality of your artifact, but basically um, its original composition, the amount of mineralization it has gone through, basically how much of it is core metal versus how much of it is mineralized corrosion product. Um, is also kind of its preservation state, basically how well consolidated is it, um, how robust or fragile it is as a result. Um, all these things affect um, your current density, um, which is basically um, how much current you're sending into this artifact um, to get the electrolytic reduction reaction that you want. So basically your settings when it comes to that DC power supply and how much energy you're sending into the system. Um, Cause you don't obviously don't wanna send too much cause you can damage your artifacts um, but if you send too little, obviously you won't get the results that you want in terms of conservation outcomes. And all, and the fun thing is that all these different variables not only affect, um, are kind of in dialogue with each other. So they kind of talk to each other. Um, like as your electrolyte concentration goes up, for example, your electrical resistance goes down. 
um, as an and as a result, your electrode potential can shift. Um, so your potentials that are were um, originally more positive or more negative on your anode or your cathode could suddenly start to reverse themselves if you're not careful um, based to these fluctuations. Um, and that in and that in um, effect then affects their current density. You might have to adjust your current density, make it lower or higher as a result in order to sort of keep um, that sweet spot where the reaction is happening in terms of your setting. Um, in terms of their current density, um, there are three kind of categories of current density, and we use them to do sort of different uh, functions. Um, low current density um, is what we want to use when we are looking at reduction. So this is what we want to use when we are essentially consolidating our material, when we are kind of really looking at our, our electrolytic reduction um, process as the reduction cell. Like the primary thing we want out of it is that sort of reverse spontaneous redox reaction where corrosion material um, that was created through spontaneous redox reaction is then sort of reverted back into solid metal or corrosion product that is more stable or mineral product that is more stable. Um, your low current density is generally what you start with. It's usually kind of your first step. Um, and it, it's, of, it's kind of how you determine what your initial electro potential is for the material. This is basically how you figure out what the um, lowest, like kind of your, what, like how much electro, uh, current you need to basically start the reaction. Like how many, how much electrons do you need to invest in the system before you get any type of reaction at all? Um, and this is sort of heralded by um, the release, there is a release of hydrogen gas, um, but it's very slow and kind of inconsistent. So um, that, re that hydrogen gas, as I mentioned earlier, is a really kind of good indicator of when your reaction is happening to make sure that reduction is happening at your cathode since hydrogen evolution occurs there. Um, so as soon as you start seeing that bubbling occurred, um, you know that you have kind of reached that low threshold for um, current density. Um, and over time, as resistance decreases um, and you have more electricity flowing through an area more quickly, um, you're going to have more hydrogen gas evolution. Um, and basically, then you're going to start moving away from the reaction as being a re as sort of getting being primarily used for reduction and consolidation. Um, your medium current density are our optimal conditions for desalination. Um, this produces this is heralded by a slow but steady evolution of hydrogen gas, um, and this tends to also be the current density that you will use for the longest period of time. It can be weeks to years until you sort of um, basically however long you need to desalinate your artifact to get it to the appropriate place. Um, your high current density um, is heralded by a vigorous evolution of gas at the cathode because you're jamming a lot of electro electrons into that cathode very quickly. Um, and this is, again, the portion that is used to mechanically clean and remove material from your artifact um, surface. Um, it can also really kind of turn up um, the amperes or the, the, um, the amplitude of which you are basically um, removing chlorides from um, your material, and it can really get some of those really deep-seated embedded chlorides out of there. Um, however, it's only really affected and safe to use um, for short periods of time, um, which I'll talk about in a, in a few minutes. Um, so um, sometimes people will start with a high density current, um, current for a short period of time to try to remove some of the initial um, concretion material from the surface and then quickly uh, adjust it to a low current density medium and then followed by medium current density. Um, and then at the very end, you might use the high current density again, just to remove any residual chlorides and to finish cleaning the artifact. Um, but often science high density current is not necessarily used at all just because there are dangers associated with, I will get to in a few, in a second. Um, so basically our, our low de current density and our medium current density are the two settings that we're really operating in um, for conservation processes. Um, so we're really looking at that reduction or really looking at um, that desalination impact that it has on our artifact and a little less about cleaning. Um, this is especially true since nowadays we, we tend to mechanically clean our artifacts and the tools with which we use our, our, um, to clean our artifacts or remove concretion and barrel matrix, et cetera, have improved a lot. Um, we usually remove it entirely um, before we put it into electrolytic reduction. Um, so we don't even really have to deal with the high current density step. But the risks of high current density um, have to do, one, with too much hydrogen gas that is produced too quickly and too early can basically seal the artifact. Basically, reduction happens so quickly um, that basically you cut off the ability for chlorides and other things to leave, essentially. You basically fill in all those holes that I mentioned um, with reduction product 
extremely quickly. Um, and then you basically can't desalinate your artifact as well as you would like. Um, the other problem is mechanical damage. Um, cast iron, which is often the material that is most likely to be subjected to um, electrolytic reduction, tends to form what we call a graphitization layer um, that is below sort of your artifact surface. So below the actual original surface of the artifact, where you might have all your, your maker's marks, your touch marks, your sort of interesting details about the con your canning, your graffiti, et cetera. Underneath that, there is usually a layer of graphite, essentially. Um, that is because cast iron is produced by mixing iron ferrite with carbon. Um, and carbon, as it oxidizes, forms graphite, essentially. It forms a mineral product of graphite. Um, and the problem is, is sometimes this graphite layer is not very well adhered. So when you start producing a lot of hydrogen gas and this expansion process happens, not only will you be removing your concretion and your other layers of corrosion and things you don't want, um, you often, you also um, very risk losing that surface of the artifact itself and actually kind of breaking or damaging your artifact through blistering or splash falling. Um, so that is the major risk of high density current and one of the ones that is reasons it is used very judiciously. Um, so to kind of summarize, our current density tends to be, um, our current density, so the settings on the DC battery supply that we use are determined by the treatment, essentially what we are trying to accomplish with our treatment, as well as the preservation state of the artifact. You know, can it be how much current density can it actually be subjected to um, before we run the risk of essentially destroying it, uh, producing too much hydrogen gas and destroying or damaging the artifact. Um, and as I kind of Hedged, uh, really poorly stated earlier, um, this can, current density settings can be used, um, you know, calculated very precisely using mathematical equations. Um, but honestly, in practice, we just tend to eyeball it. Um, we kind of want a little, we, we tend to want um, steady but not vigorous evolution of hydrogen gas. And then even that might be reduced to lower current depending on, you know, it's kind of a watch and see. Um, situation depending on sort of the effect that has on the current. Um, so it can take a little while to establish your current, your working settings and to get it to the place where you just want. Obviously, you know, experience and practice kind of reduce this time, um, but every artifact is different. Every artifact has its own little idiosyncrasies that you sort of have to account for. And the more sort of tailored you are to that artifact, often the more, um, the more um, seriously you tend to take things like calculating your currency density and you making sure your anode has as much coverage area as possible, et cetera. Um, and our last variable that we're going to talk to, I know finally we're getting towards the end, are electrolytes and our pH. Um, and this is electrolyte co um, concentration is important to maintain, uh, mostly um, in order to, of course, make sure that you have effective concentration electrical gradients and to make sure that you have a, enough electrolyte um, to be able to complete the circuit that is being established by the electrolytic cell and to continue, to continue to pass um, those electron laden ion, anions back to your anion, et cetera, and keep that moving. So you have to make sure that you're, um, you don't want to use up all your electrolytes and reduce all of them, for example. Um, you want to make sure that you also need a, a mount. You also need a sufficient concentration to be able to maintain your electrode potential. Um, you know, fluctuation in those concentrations um, can highly affect um, your electrode potential. So the electrode potential, um, in this case, the one that occurs between um, your electrode and the outside environment. Um, your pH also, you want to maintain it. We often put these materials in alkaline solutions um, for the fact that it tends to neutralize acids. Um, neutralizing acids helps slow down corrosion processes um, and increase, um, and also helps um, increase the reduction potential of the cathode um, by having more hydrogen around it. Um, you, you basically create that barrier of cations um, and kind of create that positive negative charge it has um, between itself and its environment. Um, and what we're also, um, so both these things are necessary for the actual um, functioning of the cell, you need these, you need electrodes, uh, electrolytes, you need a, an acceptable pH to make sure that your chemical reaction is happening. Um, and you also need it um, to basically maintain the integrity of your electrodes to make sure that they um, kind of survive the, the process and you get as much usage out of them as possible. Um, and basically this happens, um, if you can see from here, um, this, um, graph, it talks a little about something called passivation. Um, so what we're looking for um, is we really want to try to get these pH settings in a way where we have basically 
corrosion protection for our anode and our, and our cathode. Um, so basically where that pH is able to retard corrosion enough um, that they're essentially not falling apart on us and our anode doesn't dissolve or corrode away too quickly so that we can sustain it for a longer period of time. Um, these also, of course, um, make sure that we have an anode and a cathode to sort of maintain those two electrode potentials that maintain the overall cell potential. Um, and of course, one of the other reasons that uh, we need pH is specifically um, to make sure that um, certain species of of anions like our, um, this particular material, which is called hypochlorite chemical, uh, hypochlorite, um, which is a particularly kind of nasty, ver um, ver nasty, very acidic version of chloride um, to make sure that it doesn't build up at our anode site because it is extremely acidic and it can um, basically um, eat away at your anode and destroy it before you get much use of it. Um, this, by the way, is also one of the reasons why we need good um, circulation in our electrolytic cell um, to make sure that we don't have these concentrations of particularly hypochloride building up at our electrodes um, to make sure that um, the electrolytes are kept diffused and moving and also to make sure that our pH is distributed as well. Um, and both alkaline pH and electrolytes um, help control um, the buildup of hydrogen at both electrodes. So basically the acidity that is occurring at both electrodes, um, as well as help control the evolution weight rate. Um, that's because um, alkaline solutions contain hydroxy ions, which interact with um, hydrogen ions to form water, basically. Um, it also helps build up excess charge at these two potentials um, to make sure that our cell doesn't shut down and it continues to flow um, and do work for us. Yes, so this right here is kind of the sweet spot of our pH range. Usually eight and a half is kind of the lowest that you want to go in terms of pH. Um, we often use things like um, sodium hydroxide and sodium carbonate, things that are you know well on their way in sort of this nine to, to 14 kind of reference to try to um, control that pH from that perspective. All right, so after your artifact has come out of electrolytic reduction, um, you're still not quite done with it. Um, you have to rinse it pretty thoroughly to make sure that you neutralize all that alkaline solution we just got finished um, talking about and to make sure that your artifact can kind of come to um, a pH equilibrium as well sort of as an electronic neutralism um, environment, electronic sort of equilibrium with its environment to kind of make sure that your reaction stops, um, that those electrode potentials sort of dissipate, et cetera. Um, fall after the rinsing process, we then go through a period of controlled drying, which for, for metals can take place in a desiccation chamber or other type of dehumidification chamber, chamber where we can kind of slowly um, reduce the atmospheric moisture and very um, precisely dry the artifact um, in a way so that it doesn't dry too fast and then we experience damage or continued corrosion. Um, often in the rinsing phase, you will have some type of superficial or flash corrosion that forms on your artifact, um, so that will often need to be removed. And of course, um, electrolytic reduction, although it definitely, definitely prolongs the life of our artifact by um, particularly by removing chlorides and that effect of desalination and making it more consolidated and more physically and chemically stable, um, your iron artifact from your typical marine environment is never going to be a done deal. It's always going to be at risk of further corrosion and further degradation. Um, so that's just because it is in contact with an environment that has a lot of atmospheric moisture in it. Um, and that also probably still has some residual electrolytes present. And as long as you have atmospheric moisture and oxygen and um, electrolytes presence, you will have galvanic corrosion. You always have a risk of that naturally occurring galvanic cell um, forming on your artifacts. And in order to retard that, um, we try to kind of reduce contact with moisture and oxygen. Um, and we do that through several different ways. We can, you know, treat it with additional types of chemicals. We usually use tannic, tannic acid um, for wrought iron and, and um, cast iron, for example. Um, this produces a layer of uh, basically, it's an acid that reacts with corrosion product that forms a precipitate um, that basically um, forms a physical barrier between the artifact and the environment. Um, we use BTA kind of for a similar idea for copper alloys, for example. Um, we also often apply a, pr a protective coating on top of that treated layer, um, such as um, B72 or an acrylic resin layer or paint layer, et cetera. Um, and then lastly, and most importantly, we still have to maintain a pretty a controlled regimen of environmental control. We have to kind of make sure, um, try to control the ambient moisture, et cetera. Um, and we do that through things like using desiccants and storing them with, with materials that will absorb moisture or, or will 
in terms of air conditioning or dehumidifications will actually dry out, dry out moisture from the environment, et cetera, and sort of deny these artifacts that electrolytic solution um, that leads to corrosion activities. So thank you very much for listening. Um, if hopefully that was somewhat interesting and not too boring, uh, thank you for bearing with me. Um, so please make sure to check out our next installment of the Maritime Heritage Series, um, which is being um, put on by my friend Christian Brin at the Golden Pirates of the Silver Screen, which is occurring on May 13th next week. Um, and if you like this um, talk at all, um, I will be returning with another talk in, the, in September um, called Would You Like a Tums? Conservation Basics 3, where we'll be talking about acid-base reactions and archaeological and conservation. Oh, Michelle, before you log off, I did want to pass along. Uh, Vance Knight had to log off early, but he wanted to, uh, he left the comment of, wow, an excellent review of reduction oxidation reactions that he studied at UNC over 40 years ago. So he was very oh. impressed. Okay. <laughs> um, yes, and I, I apologize. This is my first time giving this. It's a little kinky. I haven't quite worked out the flow yet. So thank you for allowing me to kind of stumble over myself and backtrack and re-explain things like five times, but. I think you did great. Okay. okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and end the recording. We'll have that up on the museum's website within the next few days. Um, and feel free to email Michelle or the museum and we'll pass it along to her if you have any questions. Thank you. Hi, Tom. Hi, Tom.